there's something about we can say something that's more realistic and all of a sudden this defensive wall comes up and no matter what you say it's not going to penetrate that wall but the beauty of science fiction is, is you're exactly right is that the walls don't go up so we can actually you know enhance a person's brain and mind to accept other other ways and hopefully it'll go into real life situations and be a kinder person in the world. Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you, but navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello, Reflectives, and welcome to episode 276 of the Stark Reflections podcast. This is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. In today's episode, I have an interview with Diane Floyd Bame. Diane is an award-winning author of children's books, and she writes stories to inspire readers to be kind, like themselves, and embrace imagination. And we talk about that and so much more coming up later in the episode. First, let's hear a word about this episode's sponsor. This episode is sponsored by Findaway Voices. Findaway Voices is a platform that you can leverage as an author to get your audiobooks produced, to get your audiobooks distributed to more than 43 retail and library platforms around the world. Findaway Voices has multiple ways to have audiobooks produced. There are ways you can find professional narrators, do a Voices Shared payment splitting process, pay the narrator up front, DIY yourself through Findaway Voices Marketplace to find your own narrator, or leverage their internal resources to find them. Or, if you're so inclined, you can produce your own audiobooks and upload them to Findaway Voices. With Findaway Voices, you are in control, you are in charge, you decide your audio destiny. When you're with Findaway Voices, you can set and control your price at the majority of those 43 plus retail and library markets, which means you can run promotions like the promotions you can get through Chirp Audiobooks, which is run and managed by the good folks at BookBub. And I got to tell you, having had a couple of Chirp deals and continuing to run non, non-deal deals or promos from Findaway Voices to Chirp and to Apple and to Nook and to other platforms like now including Spotify, you can increase your visibility and enhancement and promotion of those audiobooks. Using this, leveraging Findaway Voices and Chirp audiobooks, I was actually able to start making money back on the investment I made in my own audiobooks. So if you're looking to invest in audiobooks, if you're looking to invest in and check out how you can leverage audio in your author journey, you can check out Findaway Voices over at starkreflections.ca slash findaway. And now a brief look at comments from recent episodes. Now, a recent comment came on Twitter from Edwin Downward, at Edwin Downward on uh, Twitter. He said, the latest Stark Reflections with Mark Leslie ended on the theme of Nothing can stop you now. Uh, That's because, of course, I I played the theme song for Perfect Strangers. Nothing's going to stop me now. (laughs) now. (laughs) At the tail end, I talked about it in in my reflection. And then, of course, I, I snuck in that little music after the end closing credits bumper um uh, anyways back to edwin's uh tweet he said i'm grabbing hold because there are voices out there telling me to give up and i refuse to let them dictate my life damn good on you edwin i love that refuse to let those voices telling you to give up refuse to listen to them refuse to let them dictate your life Patience, practice, persistence. I keep harping back on those three P's of publishing success. And and I just think about the long haul. I think about 
what it's like to stick it out. I was talking to a writer just the other day who, you know, just kept pushing and kept trying and kept pushing. And after all of this time, starting to see the success they'd hoped to have years earlier, but it's happening now because they did not give up. And I'm so glad you were inspired by that awesome Perfect Strangers television show theme song <laughs> and potentially some of the stuff that you heard in the episode. But thanks for sharing that, uh, Edwin, uh, as well. I also received this direct message. It was a message to me on Twitter, uh, and I wanted to share that. And this message comes from uh, Vale Nagel, uh, at K Vale Nagel on Twitter. And, um, and the message said, hey, Mark, I hope it's okay to send you a direct message. I got my first Chirp deal, and I know you've had some in the past from listening to the podcast. Do you have any recommendations for reducing the price on my other books? I have a $2.99 deal on a books one to three box set that's normally $39.99. And I have the single books in the series set at $14.99. I guess that's the regular price. And I have a four-hour link short story collection in the same world for $7.99. Um, uh, he goes on to say, I think the sixth book will be out when the trip deal happens next month, and I could do a second audiobook box set. Now, Garrett Robinson mentioned that he wasn't sure the ideal price, even though he's had a few uh, trip deals, but he usually does 99 cents or 2.99 for the other books in the series. I'd been thinking 4.99 for individual books, but then I thought I remembered you going lower because you certainly persuaded me to pick up all of your Canadian werewolf books. Um, <laughs> Thanks, Val. Appreciate that. Uh, feel free to answer this on the podcast too. And thanks for giving me permission to share that question because I know it's going to benefit other listeners. Um, so yeah, feel free to answer this if you think other people would like to know your answer. Uh, thanks again for the great podcast. Sorry I haven't commented on them as often. I listen while I'm out walking these days so I don't have an easy way to reach out while I'm in the Colorado wilderness. You know what it's like out there. You could be attacked by a migrating Canada goose, a coyote, or even a wild Kevin J. Anderson dictating his latest novel as he hikes. It's a dangerous place. Now, I completely get that, Val, and, and I understand that for most listeners, like myself, when I'm I'm listening to podcasts when I'm out and about, so it is difficult to remember to you know, to, to comment or, or, or whatever it is. So I, I get that, but thanks, uh, thanks for that. So let me go back to uh, the answer. Um, first of all, great to hear from you. And congratulations on the deal. That's awesome. I'm so excited. Um, I'm kind of of two, two minds uh, for this because for me, dropping the price uh, on the other on the other books as low as possible is important for just getting while they're there, while they're buying, while they've got their wallets out. Yeah, it's just an extra couple bucks here and there, right, to get the rest of the series. And that can get some reviews and some traction. Now, that's one thing. If you already have reviews and traction on the other books, the... Um, uh, four ninety nine for the other ones is is a huge discount off the regular retail price. So it's like it's five bucks, and and so you you're getting the 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 three books for three dollars, right? Two ninety nine, and then you're gonna get another book that's regularly priced at fifteen dollars for five dollars. That's a good deal. So, I yeah, it it it's kind of a it's kind of a tough one. I always maybe because I'm still young in the game of earning my money back. I've perhaps earned 40% of all the money I've spent on audiobooks. So right now, that extra whatever 10, 15, 20 cents I make per sale by getting a huge volume of sales is way better than, um, you know, I've, again, I'm now starting to sell audiobooks on a more semi-regular basis, but I still haven't earned back all the money I've invested in all of my audiobooks over the years. So Right now, I'm I'm kind of like just wanting to push it really hard, get more reviews, get more traction, and um and and hopefully uh, earn that money back uh, by running those sales. Because if it's sitting there at full price, I may not be selling as many units. Um, I don't know. It it it's a tough one, but I I kind of like I kind of like your thought. Uh, I I kind of like the um I kind of like the four to five dollar range. And I love, by the way, Vale. I love. The fact that you're setting these books at a much, much higher price. I'm still in the process of um, wanting to uh, do a larger box set for my Canadian Werewolf series so I can set like a really, really giant price on, you know, 30, uh, 40 hours 
of audiobook there and see see what I can do uh, with that. But anyway, so thank you for asking that question. So if you have any questions, you can you know hit me on Twitter at Mark Leslie. You can direct message me like that. You can email me, Mark, at markleslie.ca or comment over at the show notes over at starkreflections.ca. And now for a brief personal update. So it is Thursday, November 10th, 2022, as I am recording this, I am just days away from flying to Vegas for the 20 Books Vegas Conference. It's going to be nearly 2,000 attendees at this conference in Vegas and hundreds more uh, registered virtually watching it, uh, the live stream from home, which I love that choice, especially for introverted writers. Or you, know, you can't get out there; it's 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 not cost uh, it's cost prohibitive to get to, to Vegas, or your 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 work and life and family balance and all those things prevent you from being able to. You know, I'm very very lucky, I'm so fortunate that I can go for a full week. And everything will be okay. You know, Liz will pick up the slack over here. Uh, my my ex-wife has uh, my son with him. Well, he's 18. He can take care of himself now. But I don't have to worry about all of those personal obligations that I can go and uh, and be there for the full seven days. Because I fly out Sunday. I come back on Saturday. That being said, I am going to very shortly, within the next day or so, produce next week's episode. And I'm probably not going to have much of an introductory, et cetera, et cetera. It's just going to be the episode just so I can get it out because I have not yet missed a Friday in the five years I have doing been doing this podcast. So I want to get that out there. I want to get it uh, scheduled because I'm going to be pretty busy um, at Vegas doing all the things. I am on the main stage in the, in the main hall uh, doing a talk on uh, the um, power of and the pitfalls of publishing, and oh my goodness, there's a lot of P's there in alliteration, and I'm really looking forward. It's going to be a combination of the seven P's of publishing success, the pitfalls of publishing, and just a little bit more. I'm just kind of, you know, change things up and add a few other elements that I think would be really, really good for this mixed audience of of highly seasoned pros plus, you know, newer writers that are, are going to be there. That's going to be a, a challenge, but I think I can bring some content that will entertain, inform, and inspire. I'm doing another talk more for very specifically for beginning writers on um, the basics of being a, a professional uh, writer and publisher, uh, the business, I think it's called the business of professional writing and publishing, something like that. I have a note here somewhere. Where's, where's the note? What do I call that? I call that, um, here it is, here it is, the business basics of writing and publishing. And I kind of outlined some things that I think would be important for users, uh, users, authors to, to know. Uh, and again, I'm going to list a bunch of things that I think would be valuable for them if they're just starting out. Here are some things you just need to understand a little bit about the industry, about how the business operates, etc. So that, I'm going to be on that. I'm doing an awesome uh, panel with um, uh, Jonathan Mayberry and Marie Whitaker, uh, two uh, good friends of mine. Uh, I know through Superstars Writing Seminars, we're doing it on writing horror. That should be a fun panel. And I'm on another panel talking about universal uh, book links. Uh, I think Dave Cheston is going to be the moderator for that. Dave Cheston of Publisher Rocket. Great guy. Loves his bourbon. And you can always count on, on trying some really fun bourbon when, when you're hanging out with, uh, with Dave. So um, there's going to be a panel uh, with Dave and, and a bunch of other awesome folks. And we'll be talking about universal book links. Not just bookstory.com from Draft to Digital, but several other choices and options because I'm all about making sure authors know what their options are. So the last thing in relation to personal update is the the writing of Hex in the City that uh, Julie Strauss and I are working on. This is the Paranormal Action Adventure, sixth book in my Canadian werewolf series. And oh my God, we are having so much freaking fun on this book. Uh, we have our schedule. Uh, it was going to be NaNoWriMo. We started a little late, so we're, we're bleeding into into Decem December for this. And I'm, I'm not so much worried about getting 50,000 words done in November, although I am also writing other projects and working on things. So I may get to 50,000 words, but that's not the focus. The focus is the back and forth chapter updates. And so just this morning, so yesterday was Julie's day, and she sent me, what was it, chapter six, I believe. And I uh, had to write chapter seven. So we've got the parallel storylines of Michael in New York doing some things. Uh, Gail's off uh, in, in a different city, uh, New Orleans, uh, fighting her battles. And um, 
and it's so cool. We've roughly outlined things. I mean, Julie's done a lot more outlining than I I have as, as she's, you know, that's her style. My style's no outline. <laughs> so the fact that I have a little bit is kind of cool. But uh, see, I'm learning from her. I'm growing as a writer. But uh, I got her chapter. And, you know, the first thing I did after I, you know, I fed the animals and I got the coffee on is I sat there and I read through it and I was just so excited. And then, you know what, then the chapter ends, I'm like, oh no, oh my God, I can't, ah, ah. And I'm dying, I'm itching to see what happens next. I just, I absolutely love that. And and then the process is is so fun because then I go through and, and I make comments on her chapter. Uh, I make some, uh, you know, very rough high level edits, notes, things like that. And then I begin to write my next chapter and and I did that uh, early this morning spent a couple hours on it got a few thousand words done I put it aside I do my regular work day the stuff I do with draft to digital of course recording this podcast uh, email correspondence etc answering people's questions and comments and stuff on Facebook related to draft to digital or the industry in general and then uh, towards the end of the day, I'll, I'll pick it up, you know, having had a bit of a break, kind of go through it, tweak it a little bit, send that back to Julie, and then she will, of course, tomorrow, write the next chapter, in which case it's back over to me to write the next one. So we're going to continue this process. It's going to be tricky when I am in Vegas. Let me just take a quick look at the schedule. So yeah, she's going to send me chapter eight on the, on the 11th, November 11th. I'll be doing chapter 9 on, on Saturday the 12th. And we normally take weekends off, but I wanted to get that chapter done um, uh, earlier because I knew I wasn't going to get as much done in Vegas. So then, you know, I fly out to Vegas on the 13th, and then she sends me on the uh, end of day, or she works on the 14th, so, you know, for the 15th I'll have chapter 10. Then on the 15th, the Tuesday, I will write chapter 11. Julie will do chapter 12 on, on Wednesday. Thursday I'll have chapter 13 and then she does chapter 14 and then of course it's a flight day for me again on on the following saturday and uh i suspect it's going to be hard for me uh to get any writing done when i'm in vegas so what i may do is i may if i have opportunities to uh, for example i get into vegas on the sunday i'll probably meet up with uh you know some of the draft digital folks that i work with go out for dinner stuff like that but i'll probably try to get some writing done once I get checked into the hotel room and uh, and just try to get a little bit ahead so that, you know, if, if I fall behind later in the week, I still have some things that I can work on. But but that's what's going on. And um, and I'm, I'm so looking forward to 20 Books Vegas. It's often a really great conference, lots of wonderful content, uh, getting to network with lots of great people there. And of course, I'm so thrilled that while I'm at this conference, you know, being inspired by so many other writers and their stories and the things they share, um, you know, being in the throes of what I love the most. And, and, and two things I, I love the most are I, I do love speaking uh, in, in public. I do love speaking on stage and helping to, uh, you know, share information and insights, etc. with with other writers. But I also just love, love, love when I'm in the midst of of a book and uh and 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 i can feel it in my bones the itchiness of getting back to that scene now last night after uh, before julie sent me her chapter she was in the in the midst of kind of like rewriting and working on it because uh, yesterday was her day we did a we did a zoom chat just to get caught up and and to confirm a couple things uh, because again we're kind of writing in parallel and so we're having to go back and tweak and adjust things so that they line up better um but Oh my God, <laughs> I get off these phone calls and I'm so energized, especially by her energy and her enthusiasm uh, about working on it. And then I'm reading her chapters and I'm, I'm reading Gail and all the stuff that's going on. And, and this is a character I created, but she's just taking Gail to bold new places. And I'm so excited because she's so on character. She's so Gail, but I don't know what's going to happen next. And I am absolutely riveted and I'm loving this process. I do hope, dear listener, that whatever projects you're working on, that you're filled with that passion and that energy and that enthusiasm, because honestly, that keeps me going. My sales are not always, you know, clocking everywhere I want them to be. I'm pretty lucky right now. I'm I'm doing regular daily sales and, 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 and higher volumes than ever before. They just keep slowly creeping up over time. Nothing spectacular, nothing like New York Times, USA Today, best-selling kind of numbers, but Again, growing uh, consistently over time, and uh, and that's great. But 
the thing that really motivates me, that really gets me excited is, is being in the midst of that creation and just loving the story, you know, especially as it's unfolding from Julie's side, but also the story that I'm unfolding because I'm kind of, I'm kind of uh, enjoying discovering what's happening next. I, I do have some ideas of where it's going to go and stuff like that, but it kind of is unraveling as I go. I'm just watching what Michael is up to and recording uh, the things that he does, which I just adore that so much. Okay, but enough of me getting excited and passionate and thrilled about my writing. Um, again, just hoping that you have something fun like that that you can that you can uh, hang on to that that passion, that thrill, that uh, excitement, rather than you know all the all the business of writing and all the things that tend to bog us down. Uh, hopefully, you can you know return as a checkpoint to those moments in your own writing. But that's it for my passion and enthusiasm with my personal update. Why don't we get into this wonderful conversation that I have with Diane Floyd Bame? Diane, welcome to the Stark Reflections podcast. Thanks. I'm so excited about being here. Well, it's good to get a chance to chat with you again. This time the tables are turned. I'm the one doing the interviewing as opposed to you interviewing me. But I, I, I wanted to uh, give my uh, listeners a bit of a background beyond the biography I just shared. Sort of your background as a writer, as a is a creative person, et cetera. Sure, I'd be happy to. I wasn't always a writer. I started off actually as um, a, a teacher. I okay. taught from four-year-olds all the way up to eighth grade. Um, and actually from there, I went to training teachers on how to even turn on the switch for a computer. So that really dates me. What, with it? I, IT t t training for teachers? <laughs> yes, that's correct. I was one of those teachers uh, before there was even a degree in it. Um, who was self-taught and we turned around and taught other teachers about the magic of learning using a computer. So, 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 okay, let, let's go back to that role. So you're teaching uh, anywhere between grade two to, to grade eight and technology comes along. Mm -hmm. It's no longer just chalkboards. <laughs> yes. The things that happen. Um, how did that evolve? Because obviously you're not in that classroom anymore. Were you were you working for a local board where you went around and trained teachers? How did how did that progression happen? Sure. Actually, I was very blessed because I was living in the Philippines and Steve Jobs decided to use the American school there as a school to see if teachers would like his new computer. Okay. And so computers were sent to the school and um we were asked to learn how to use a floppy disk and write <laughs> down notes and so forth. And I tell you, I I fell in love with the computers right then and there and saw how much um, I could help students because not all of us are um, learn by just listening right. and uh, I don't know, you're really young, so you may not know what a floppy disk is, but the kids were very excited. So when I came stateside, I was sort of like that weird person who knew where the switch was. And I just naturally started teaching everyone and the, you know, my friends that I worked with at school and just one step evolved from another. And then Apple, they, they selected 12 teachers to be like the teachers in the US, the very first ones to learn even more. And it just snowballed into wow. traveling internationally, actually, and training teachers. So, oh, wow, that's, yeah. that's quite a bit different. That's yeah, it was. It was very exciting. Well, I have to I have to let you know, I not only know what a floppy disk is, but I have the big floppies and the small hard floppies. They still call them floppies, even though they weren't yes. floppy. Uh, and I still have stories on those. Oh my goodness, I'm so impressed. I thought I was the only one like that. I have some cassettes too with my stories on. <laughs> Press play on tape one. So, uh, so I, I have to I have to say so that that's the other challenge that happens to writers too, right? Is there's writers who, you know, leverage the technology and jump right into it, and others that may be going, well, it, this is like a typewriter, but it goes on a screen. <laughs> That's do you, right. do you, do you, have you found parallels between that the, the teaching world of, in technology and then the writing world in technology? Sure. But I will say that I personally enjoy still pen and pencil, paper. And do pencil. You, is that how you write still? I really love that. You actually there, write longhand first time, like with, with a pen and paper, pencil and paper. Yes, I actually do. Okay. Um, 
and I don't know, there's something about it flows beautifully, right. but there will be times when I wake up in the middle of the night and a, because I, I mainly write children's books right. and the story has come to me right. and I get up right then and there and I type as fast as I can before the story leaves me. Because you know how that is, right? Well, and that's probably because you can type a lot faster than you can write. Now, I have to ask, um, uh, is it is it um, uh, cursive writing that you're doing? And I know it's not not cursing because it's yeah, children's book, but cursive. <laughs> yeah, cursive, cursive. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Awesome. And, and is there a particular notebook you use or is it just whatever piece of paper is handy <laughs> when you're inspired? So, uh, no, I actually have a book um, that okay. I take with me to write notes and ideas when they come along and then there's an actual book but i have several so it depends in the middle of the night which one i oh god you know, and find out <laughs> which one it is <laughs> so so let's walk through this process of, of writing a children's book just for people who aren't familiar with okay so you have the idea You've written the the idea. Now, obviously, a children's book is not going to be eighty thousand words. Are they picture books? Are they books for young readers? Like, what's the age group that we're talking about? So, mine are picture books. Okay. But I like to say, even even though some authors disagree, that my children's books, because they're multi layer, right. how a child might interpret it, a parent is going to interpret it at a higher level. Right. And so, um, for example, a time to fly. It's all about a little bird who's afraid to leave his nest, but in the end, he discovers he can do it. Right. Well, I think that's inspirational for all of us because there's yes. these moments that we're like, oh, do I want that job? I don't know. Can I do it? You know, I mean, I, yeah. it's happened to me several times. And then you're like, you do it and you're like, I don't know what I was so afraid of, man. It's okay. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Right. So, yeah. yeah. Well, no, I, and I think that's true because the, the lessons we learn as children, we're constantly relearning as adults because maybe it didn't take or maybe I, I find at least that we start off with so much as kids we're open-minded we're willing to learn we're willing to take things in and be and then something happens that beats that inspiration <laughs> that creativity out of us as adults we forget mm -hmm. how to just be receptive to the world so when you were talking about um uh, afraid to fly that reminds me of I mean having been a bookseller you know, most of my life Dr. Seuss, you think of as a yeah. children's author and kids love them, hop on pop and you've got green eggs and ham and all the fun stories and, and stuff like that. But when I was uh, working at a university bookstore, we were uh, selling and we kept tons of stuff. We did have a, a children's section because 6,000 people worked on campus and bought books for their family. Uh, but, um, oh, the places you will go. Uh, mm -hmm. as one that graduates by so it almost seems like you know this is this would be smart for bookstores to carry for people at that next journey in their life whatever it is whether it's a new job whether it's graduating from grade eight from high school from from uh you know from college or uh or just you know i'm moving to the philippines to teach <laughs> like true. it seems like that could be that could be a perfect gift for people like that right I think you're absolutely right. Thank you for catching the magic of that story. That's absolutely right. And um, and that's what I want in all my books. Some of my books are, you know, the, the kids are like, oh my gosh, they look so different. I don't know if I want to be friends with them. But the way I introduce it, they're like, oh, in the end, I'll be friends with anybody because they're just like me. <laughs> you know? Awesome. It's amazing. Uh, yeah. Those lessons that, that we, uh, that we take as children and often forget. So that's, mm -hmm. that's really cool. So, so potentially when, when someone's reading it to a child, they're also going, Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Oh yeah. Because when we come into office situations and a new person comes along and you're like, wait a minute, you know, I just got things going the way I want. And now I got to train another person. Right. And they look, you know, they dress kind of weird, right? Or yeah. I remember in high school, um, and this really dates me because, <laughs> um, but a new kid came in from uh, California and he had flower shirts and almost everybody wears plaids when I was in high school. Right. The guys, oh yeah, right? plaid was big. Plaid yeah, was big. And, and all of a sudden <laughs> this kid's wearing a, you know, a flower shirt, like, oh my God gosh what has just happened and of course you know he turned out to be like a really neat person but right. he quickly changed to black <laughs> we had to conform right? but, but, but by the end of the school year 
everybody was wearing flower shirts because they went. And, and so that just shows the beauty of us learning and working together, right? No, I love that because obviously it's like, hey, this is different. Yeah. This is different. But rather than just try to conform the the, the different person, it was more of a, oh, let's expand uh, and, and realize there are other ways to do things. I, right. I can, yeah, because I mean, oh, my God, the new kid, the new hire into the office where everyone has a culture and an environment they're used to. And then the new person comes in and feels uncomfortable or the new kid uh, in yeah. the school feels, Oh boy, what have I just stepped into? <laughs> right. Exactly. So that book is good for, for, for um, both sides, uh, people who are, um, you know, uh, welcoming new people into their lives, but also people who are new into, you know, different experiences, different cultures, different places. Uh, absolutely. And that's why I say my books are um, have different, it's layering. Okay. So that you read it at different levels. And right. even if some of my books, the, the stories might be high end for kindergarten as far as the sight words and so forth, the messages get across. Right. And, you know, when the loved one's reading or the teacher's reading to the, the class, they can interject and ask questions and just really right. expand where we're going. And, uh, and that's what I love. That's yeah, the teacher and, in me coming out. Well, I even think um, uh, science fiction is, is an area I, I play a lot in, in terms of, you know, the genres that I write in. And a lot of people will say that science fiction is a perfect way to criticize reality without criticizing reality because people get defensive. Uh -huh. But you can take science fiction and set it on a di distant planet and look at exactly what we're doing. And you go, well, that's weird. Why do they do that? <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. it's a mirror held up to reality, but it's a way we can, it's a way we can step outside ourselves and not be so possessive of the way mm -hmm. things are always done mm -hmm. and maybe see, see ourselves in a new light by looking at it through a fictional story. So maybe the fictional stories are ways for us to reflect on our lives, right? Uh, on on lessons, on 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 just well, like you said, morality too, right? Absolutely, I think you made a great point, and thank you for doing that with your own stories because there's something about we can say something that's more realistic, and all of a sudden this defensive wall comes up, and no matter what you say it's not going to penetrate that wall. Right. But the beauty of science fiction is, is you're exactly right. Is that we're not, the walls don't go up. So we yeah. can actually, you know, enhance a person's brain and mind to accept other, other ways. And hopefully it'll, it'll <clears throat> go into real life situations mm -hmm. and be a kinder person in the world. And just like we can look at this bird That's and right. see ourselves without getting defensive and go, well, that's a, you know, that's a, a bald Canadian middle-aged guy. <laughs> <laughs> I can see myself in the bird because I don't have any defenses. So I, I can learn, I can learn from that. So, so let's go back to the, the logistics and the mechanics. So you have the idea, you've got all these layers in mind and you're writing and you're writing a story. How does that work? Because this is one where it's not just the text, but it's your text plus images. So what are the next logical steps that you take when, when you actually realize that you've got a complete book there? Right. Thank you. So in my mind, I start thinking and imagining each, each uh, sentence okay. and each where I want it to go. So I will do something that some illustrators don't like. I'll start putting down what I imagine it. The picture okay. to be like okay. and so I try to get an illustrator who enjoys uh, working with me or you know another author right. um, whoever they may be and so it's a collaboration okay. and it's quite exciting to do that do you, have you worked with the same illustrator on more than one book or do you do, does each book dictate a different style beautiful question um actually I'm not an artist, but I decided to start taking art classes and I illustrated a couple of my own books. Oh, did you? Okay. Yes. And then my youngest daughter helped with the book. So that was sort of a long answer, but the short answer is I have different illustrators for two reasons. One, um, I think um, different illustrators can bring a different look to a book that I might be going for. Right. And the second is because I feel it took a long time to get published. And, and when I did, I realized 
there's a lot of illustrators who haven't been published and they want to be published. And right. so if I can turn around and help them get out there with their beautiful artwork, then I want to do that. Oh, that's great. Sort of um, pay forward type thing. So how did how did that how did that work for the publishing? Did you find a publisher? How did you go about that process then? Well, I tried the traditional route okay. and that could turn into a movie. So I won't bore you there because <laughs> we will it's, it's have a, a whole movie show, there. Yes. <laughs> but um uh, OC publishing out of Canada picked me up and um it's a small um hybrid. It's getting quite big now that I think about it. So I better clarify that, but it's um, hybrid publishing. Okay. And so for those who are listening, hybrid is a combination of like an indie author and um, the publisher. And I love that because then the publisher does all the hard work and I just have to write the story right. and they find the illustrators for me. And because of the way I want to work with the illustrator, we try to find one that wants to communicate. And can you bring one together. along with you for, for that ride, if that's the... Yes, I can do that too. And actually, for um, two of my books, excuse me, I brought um, an illustrator from Maine because I really like the way she does um, her, um, her watercolors. And um, another illustrator I brought from Texas on another book because... Um, She's just brilliant and we live next to each other. And so we could just collaborate really easily. And you've got a, a new book coming out where I'm talking to you early in October, 2022. You've got a new book coming out very, very shortly, right? It probably will be out by the time this airs actually. Yes, October 8th. It's in pre-sale right now on Amazon okay. and um, it's called Charlie and the Tire Swing. <laughs> so what's what's this one about? It says how it began. So what, what began, is that one about? Because yeah. it's going to be turned into a series. Oh, I'm oh yeah, I'm very excited. Um, so it's a picture book right now, and uh, the series will probably be for early uh, readers. Uh, the right. publisher and I are still working out the details. But Charlie and the Tire Swing is, and how it began, is actually inspired by my um, young my son, because when he was little, he would loved his tire swing and he's like come on mommy let's go let's go play and i'm going to tell you a story and he would just twist and turn on the tire swing he goes okay now let's go to space you know and another day oh, i'm dick tracy you know and so he was just always doing stuff right. <laughs> and um i decided that i worry about young kids always on their devices Right. And I, I just want them to put the devices down and look up at the clouds and just let their brain be free to imagine. And right. that's what Charlie and the Tire Swing's all about. How it began, though, is like in Texas, just like in many places, we have these giant oak trees that just go forever and ever and ever. And I thought, wouldn't it be fun to talk about how intergenerational, you know, how great grandpa was with his grandson and they planted an acorn. And so all this magic happens and it, you know, it shows the young listener about patience and working through the seasons and how things can even grow when it's underground and snows all over it. And the illustrator just did a magnificent job of going through the seasons and Again, intergenerational because you have great grandpa, grandpa, daddy, and the little boy, and um, awesome. grandma's there too in the pictures. But um, it's, it's a sweet story. <laughs> when you were talking about the, the the tire swing and the imagination, I mean, I, I do remember. Like I used, I was Superman when I got, you know, I <laughs> dove through the tire, and then that was me flying through. Um, <laughs> But that was part of, uh, well, the childhood I grew up in was going down to the park and, and pretending that the park was a spaceship and we were landing on different planets and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And the different levels and stations that we were mimicking stuff from TV shows. Let's talk a little bit about that importance of, I mean, making up, making stuff up. I think of the classic when you think of Calvin and Hobbes mm -hmm. and you think of the cartoons of this little boy and, and, and just the powerful, I mean, Hobbes is a stuffed animal, and yet <laughs> we see him as just a friend of his, right? A, a philosophical companion we have long, long, meaningful conversations with. But the you know that that exploration 
that we can do where, where suddenly that's not a door, that's a gateway to another dimension, right? That's not a closet, that's right. a, whatever. Um, so, so when you're, when you're thinking about that in your creativity, what are, what are some of the things that people can do potentially to encourage that sort of creativity in their, in their own lives and, and, and influencing the potentially the young, the young people around them? Another great question. I like to tell people like, we're all storytellers. So first just feel comfortable to know you are a storyteller and all we have to do is just improve upon it. So take a pen for instance and make the pen come to life. How could you do that? Well, what's the pen gonna do? You look at the pen, <gasps> can the pen draw a tree and in the tree, <gasps> what? It has a little knot hole. What's in the knot hole? A squirrel. What's the squirrel doing? And you just go on and on. Just take anything. You know, look how they created the cartoon SpongeBob. Well, that's an ordinary thing. Well, pick up a sponge. Well, before we had SpongeBob, you could have thought of all kinds of fun things. So yeah. imagination or going out and just laying in the ground and looking up at the clouds and and what do you see oh oh my goodness I see an elephant do you see the trunk so I, I think very basic <laughs> oh yeah I love that and clouds are really great because they're changing typically mm -hmm. with wet weather and wind conditions so rapidly that in one minute or one second one group of time you see something and then it changes to something completely else <laughs> No, it looked like an elephant. No, it's a giraffe. <laughs> and and for you, it's like, oh my gosh, there's a skeleton there's in the werewolf. And then more skeletons, more ghosts. Yeah. That's all I see. Monsters. Um, <laughs> so you also did this uh online story garden. I was really fascinated by it. Can you talk a little bit about what what that was all about? Sure. Um I love the story garden. I love YouTube. YouTube enables us to do so many things, us being anyone who wants to get a message out there, especially if it's a positive message. And with story garden, I wanted to create something that was A, free for everyone, and B, no, it is a safe place for parents to know the stories that are going to be there are clean, cut, and wholesome and they don't have to worry about anything happening. Right. It also gives an opportunity, especially to indie authors, to get their message and story out there. So not only do you hear my stories, but you hear stories and little snippets from the authors. And some authors read their host stories, some authors just do okay. a highlight. And uh, that's what the Story Garden is all about. So um, people could go there now, um, and w w adults or children could go yes. there now and find a plethora of stories, like sort of this backlist, as we'll call it in the publishing yeah. industry, backlist <laughs> yes. of videos then. Yes, that's correct. And I'll be updating it. Um, I got a little behind, but mm. um, I'll be updating it. And uh, I'm very excited about what's up there. I also try to read stories because I had a lot of parents email me and say, you know, could you do some um, junior high stories? So, yeah, okay. yeah. so it was, that was very exciting. So I started first doing uh, stories that I discovered I couldn't be doing, like Nancy Drew. I didn't realize that <laughs> Disney owned Nancy Drew. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I tried to do stories that um, I enjoyed, right. or maybe my brothers. I have five brothers. So um, I would remember stories my parents would read to them. But now um, it's really fun. I collect, uh, my husband and I both, we collect um, vintage or antique uh, books. And so I tried now to reintroduce stories that were written in the 1800s. Oh, so they're okay. public domain. And right. So you're not yeah, violating yeah. anyone's copyright. So. And it has been so much fun it's because... Fun. Um, I, I'm just having a blast reading these stories. And I think they they uh, help kids step into a world that, um, again, imagination, because when you read some of the stories, you have to picture what it was like in the 1800s yeah. and uh, be in that stagecoach and <laughs> click and clack, click and <laughs> clack, you know? Yeah. Wow. So for any, for any authors listening, 
if they have um, family friendly age appropriate stories where they're willing to share, is there a way for them to contact you and say, Hey, I've got a story. I'm happy for you to use it. Oh yes. That would be so awesome. All they have to do is go to my website because you can email me right there and um, let me know that you want to um, do something with a story garden. We'll set up a time and away we'll go. So does that where you do it with them or do you read it? How does that, how does yeah, that? Yeah, they, they, I know they do it with me. They read it. Oh, okay. Yeah, so yeah. it's almost so like it's just an interview. Like you and I, yeah. Oh, cool. Small so they, little interview. It's, oh, it's all fun. about them. No, I don't read it. This is their awesome. moment to shine. Cool. So uh, Diane, that, that's really awesome. I love that you're, you're providing content, free content for people to enjoy, take advantage of, leverage, spark their imaginations, set their imaginations on fire. Um, and you're also giving authors an opportunity to reach those people, which is phenomenal. Thank so uh, in that vein, uh, you've got experience having released and published books and also working with authors and helping get their stories out there into the world. What's something that you wish you had known as a beginning writer, either about writing children's uh, books or just about writing in general that you'd like to sort of endow my listeners with? Sure. I would say <laughs> I wish I would have known that authors could have publicists because it would have made a big difference in the world. I thought only movie stars have publicists. Right. And um, by having a publicist, uh, my books are getting out there. My name's being heard. And that's what it's all about. I, you know, yes, everyone would love to have their book as a movie. And yes, oh, I, you know, want to always make it to the top of the right. list all the time. But truly <laughs> my goal, that that's just, you know, that, that would be lovely. But really, my goal is if a person is looking for a book to make the child giggle, to bring bonding with the person that they're reading with, whether it's a teacher in the classroom or a loved one at home, then, then I, I, I've done my job. I yes, made them uh, happy. I love that. How, how did you find uh, your publicist that you're using? And, and can you share who your publicist is? Or is this... So no, no so taking, I'm happy to. <laughs> not taking new clients or anything. <laughs> <laughs> if he's not taking new clients, I don't know. Um, but no, I belong to this author group with Amy, uh, with Author Talk and so forth. And um, she told me about uh, Mickey Milkinson. And um, he interviewed me, which I loved that because it was important, again, to make sure our personalities work together and we're right. on the same um, wavelength. And to me, I think he works miracles every day. I'm just blown away saying, you're a star. I love you. <laughs> hey, I feel the Hi, same Mickey. way. <laughs> <laughs> I do feel the same way. That's, that's really, really cool. And that's uh, Mickey Mickelson of the, the creative edge. Creative edge. Right. Publicity, right. Yes. Awesome. And, we and, have very, the same and very person, personalized. Right? Yeah. Uh -huh. Very personalized um, uh, content, very specific to each uh, author's needs. It's amazing. Which, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, He's teaching me a lot. Awesome. So uh, Diane, can you please let my listeners know where they can find out and learn more about you online? Sure. Again, my website, uh, dianefloydbame.com. I'm going to spell it because it does not look like it sounds. <laughs> so it's D-I-A-N-N-F-L-O-Y-D-B-O-E-H-M.com. And I'm on uh, Instagram, Facebook, all the general all the usual suspects. All the usual suspects. And, and there will be links to all those uh, in the show notes over at starkreflections.ca. Diane, thank you so much for hanging out with me today. Oh, my pleasure. I hope to see you soon. And I hope you come back on our shows again, too. <laughs> Definitely. There's two things that I wanted to reflect on. Uh, the first is when, when Diane talks about uh, imagination and storytelling and that everyone has that ability that creativity that imagination the storytelling i love the exercise she uses uh, to, to get that out of people um because i mean we all know story we've grown up we've experienced story we absorb story all the time and and i and i love that um 
I just I just love that as well. There's the the online uh, community again, looking at collaboration and and she engages in collaboration on numerous levels, obviously, which works really well, really well. Whether it's in the writing of the books or even in the publishing of the books, and that kind of harkens to the second reflection. Now, I am inherently, inherently, leery of any publishing services provider that calls themselves a hybrid publisher. And the reason I'm leery about them is because a lot of the operators in that part of the industry who call themselves hybrid publishers are trying to masquerade as publishers and trying to trick authors into purchasing services from them. Now, after I had this conversation with Dan, I went and looked into OEC Publishing because um, uh, a, a fully uh, supported, uh, full service self-publishing uh, providers or fully supported self-publishing providers. There are um, a lot of them out there, thousands and thousands actually, but not all of them operate with integrity, not all of them operate with transparency. Some of them pretend to be a real publisher and trick authors into signing contracts where they have to pay tens of thousands of dollars for what often turns into useless material. So like I said, um, uh, th th this is, this is a, a minefield for uh, authors who are wanting to self-publish or get into that realm um, because of the allure of, oh, a publisher. Now, now the benefit of these self-publishing providers is authors don't have to learn uh, the business aspects. They, they, they don't have to find an editor or designer or any of that. The, the, these publishing service providers do that work for them. And, and, it, and of course, it costs money. Um, and so they have to pay for that and then they have to make a living. I get that. It's a business. I understand that. But I always, I'm always leery and always curious to see what these different publishers are up to. So I looked into OC Publishing. Well, Canadian as well. I'm a Canadian. And, and I checked them out. And so I was impressed with the fact that they operate with openness and an upfront confirmation of how they work. They're not trying to deceive authors. They are very clear about what they're going to charge. There's no deceptive operational practices at play here. They say it will cost you this much money. And they also have a submission. So they don't just accept anything either. They actually do some curation because obviously, you know, they're doing some sort of picking. And, and I noticed when I went to look, their submission window was closed, which tells me they're not in the business of just trying to suck money out of authors. They're in the business of actually trying to help and support writers. And, and they tell you how much it's worth. And so I think it, it's really intriguing. They also had this, this uh, on their website. Please read the following before submitting. OC Publishing is a hybrid slash partner publisher, which is a fee to publish model. There, bam, right up front. They're being honest with you right up front. Gotta love them. A breakdown of costs will be sent once it is mutually determined between the author and the publisher that there is an interest in partner publishing your book. So again, unlike a lot of the vanity outfits out there, they don't just take anything. They actually want to make sure it's a good quality product. And you've got to admire that because they're doing, they're adding that value that a publisher brings there. So that's great. Uh, next paragraph says, the average cost is anywhere between $3,000 and $6,000. This will include all editing and design, title setup, and distribution for both print and ebook. The cost will depend on how things such as the, um, sorry, the cost will depend on things such as the length of the manuscript, how much editing is required, the complexity of the cover and interior design, the number of illustrations for a children's book, and if uh, there is original art commissioned, for example. All costs are discussed up front before the process begins. So, OC Publishing, they, 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 uh, they pass all of my personal tests. So, while I, I started this reflection saying, I'm really, really Larry. So, I started off 100% skeptical and, and worried for Diane and thinking, what has she gotten herself into? And I looked at OC Publishing and, and I look at them and I think, no, this is a self-publishing service provider that is bringing a value, a much needed value to the industry. There are plenty of authors who do not want to learn and do all of those steps. And this is a publisher that's helping them figure that out. That's walking them through the process that it obviously has to charge them for it too. But that's part of their business. And they're very clear 
about how it works. And I didn't see anything on their website to indicate a bestseller package or anything where they're trying to deceive or trick or lure writers. They're just looking for writers who don't want to learn the business and, and design and production and they, they have access to editors, etc., a suite or a team or freelancers that they work with or whatever for different projects. They pick projects. And, and again, it's it very much like the way a publisher works. It's a relationship. And so I think Diane found a really great partner in that. And I think even though I'm, you know, I'm a fan of doing it yourself, I do know that there are authors who don't want to do that work. And that's and I respect that. It may mean when you work through a, a publisher like this, they have a lot, like like a traditional publisher, they have a lot of different clients. So they may not be able to go in and depending on how they're, uh, what tools they're using for distribution, may not be able to set up, you know, price promos with you or whatever, or they may, may be willing to do that. I don't know. Um, I am probably going to try and reach out to OC Publishing and, and see if maybe I can interview someone from there because... I do think, like I said earlier in this podcast, I want authors to have options and choices and and whatever works best for you as an author. The thing I don't like, that I dislike, that I hate, absolutely abhor, are when people try to trick authors or tell authors there is only one way to do things. The only one way to do things is the way that works really for you and your goals as an author. So again, a wonderful, inspiring conversation with Diane. It even helped me look at a new uh, publishing uh, services provider or, or, or hybrid or partner publisher, as OC Publishing calls themselves, and, and make me look at them in a new light and open my eyes to the, the fact that, no, no, Mark, you can't just be black and white about this. There are, yes, there's lots of crooks and, and shady people in the business. You can usually find them on Writer Beware, run by the SFWA. Victoria Strauss has been running that for a long time. Um, and you, you can find shady operators listed there. I'll have a link to that in the show notes at starkreflections.ca. But but that there are uh, op- operators who, who um, uh, publishers uh, and providers like that that operate with utmost integrity. And you gotta love that because again, they're providing another opportunity for writers, that's about partnership and collaboration, which I always love. I love partnership and collaboration. So that is it for this reflection. That is it for this episode of the podcast. I hope you enjoyed episode 276 with Diane Floyd Bame. And I hope you enjoyed all aspects of the podcast. You can always leave your comments, of course, over at starkreflections.ca. And if you want to support the podcast, you can join the patrons who support this podcast over at patreon.com slash starkreflections. Or you can leave a review for the podcast on whatever podcatcher you're listening to this on. Or better yet, share this podcast with someone that you think would find value in it. So as I said, that is it for episode 276. Until next week and next episode, uh, 277 will be pre-published, pre-scheduled. That's the word, scheduled, scheduled. It will be pre-scheduled out uh, for next week while I am in Vegas. I hope you have a wonderful week of writing. And so until my voice and your ears meet again. This is Mark Leslie LeFay wishing you great writing and good Stark Reflections. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomptech.com.